Give you an update on well Pace and Park and how we handled that, but more talk about what we do from not only our state level, but I took a, an informal poll, so Katie, you didn't know you were being polled, because I didn't know I was giving this speech, um, <laughs> but I was trying to figure out uh, before we became uh, one of the positive states for uh, the neurologic <laughs> EHV that um, figuring out how the other positive or other states that had positive cases did things. So I'll give a, a rundown of all those different states. Also, keep in mind the people that gave me these answers were in the know in the states, but they didn't know that their answers were appearing on this, and they may have changed it because I took that information a couple couple months ago. Uh, we all know that this is a national problem. Uh, we've seen it uh, from from Florida's point of view in Wellington. We've also seen it uh, in Utah. I believe there were five states in 2012. Currently, we've already had eight states in 2016 that have been positive. Uh, they, whenever we look at it, it's costly from both the industry perspective, abortions, they, they're losing full crops. Uh, the On the respiratory side, those weanlings and yearlings can be losing training. They, have vet bills associated with that. Um, and then we've also seen this neurologic form that, that creeps up and, and can cause death. That's just the same as an abortion as a death. Um, but this is a, you know, an, a horse that's actively out there. Um, it can be racing, it can take out a simple uh, horse that you know, doesn't have the economic value, it can take out a horse that does. Um, there's a balance between the people that are under the quarantine trying to get and, and get freedom of release and then the other balance is protecting those horses that are not in the quarantine uh, and protecting them from movement and, and spread of this disease. So uh, for Florida, EHV itself is not a reportable disease. However, neurologic horses are for per our Florida Administrative Code, which is 5C20, that's a bunch of legal mumbo jumbo. But that's how we spring into action, is that is the neurologic disease is reported. As soon as we get that report, uh, we will figure out a way to get the sample curried to our Bronson, Bronson Laboratory, it's Florida's laboratory, it's located, call it Central Florida, like around Orlando, for those of you that know Florida better. Uh, we will find a way to get it there, whether that is one of our state health officials going to get it. Um, we have plenty of support staff and such that a lot of states don't. Um, or we'll get the vet or somebody to drive it in. They can get the same day answers, which is great. Uh, if it is a positive for the neurologic, we quarantine the whole premises. Um, so at that point, uh, we we'll go in and start talking to them about biosecurity. Some, some different farms have substantially more already in place. Uh, some have almost none. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a farm. It can be uh, you know, a racing premises or a showgrounds. And, and generally that's where it is, right? Because that's where you have the more uh, everybody communicating around the increased stress. Um, next thing that we do is we require twice daily temp logs. And those have to be submitted at least once a day, but for this case, you'll see a little bit later on that they generally run them up to us twice a day. So that we'd give them, we'd hand them out as they were coming in. As they go back for, or go for lunch, they give us a temp log. Anything that had fevers were automatically tested. One of my biggest things is communication. Communication is huge across, and as a, a young state employee, and Nat White's thing is, is awesome, don't report it to Nat White's thing before you tell your own Department of Agriculture. <laughs> That's a bad idea. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, let your own Department of Ag know before you put that in. I was like, oh, good, I'm going to log that on that. And then, phew, I'm off, and yeah. Okay. Uh, tracing of exposed horses is also very important. We did have a couple of trace outs. So from the state's perspective, well, what do we follow? There's multiple different recommended protocols, and these range back from years ago. There's the AAEP, which has 21 to 28 days with either testing or no testing, AVMA at 21 days, and then uh, Katie's helpful document, the USAHA um, consensus statement 
for the guidance document, which is 14 to 21 days, depending on testing, no testing, spread of disease, and such. So whenever we have all these different states, we have different ways that they did things um, or, or are doing things. Um, again, I got these from different people within each state, but they didn't know that their answers were going to be here, so I'm not going to tell you who I got it from. Arizona has a 21-day quarantine. That's just straight. Febrile horses are tested. That's pretty consistent across everything. Uh, febrile horses are, are going to be tested. Exposed horses require normal temps and, and are released. Um, the index case and any other positive cases that come from either the temps or clinical signs will also require negative PCR test results. California has kind of a dynamic um, change, and that's actually very similar to Florida's. It's not just one size fits all. It's not a cookie cutter model. Um, we get, you know, all sorts of different. So that length of time is based on a assess or an assessment of biosecurity and evidence of disease spread. If there is not evidence of disease spread, then, they, then they'll tend to release in 14 days. If there is, then they would uh, hold those horses for 21 days. That's very similar to Florida's. Um, quarantine of the index case versus the barn versus the premise is, and that's where we differ a little bit. We, we quarantine the whole premise. They uh, do an epidemiological, well, we do the epidemiological or investigation also but they use that to determine whether uh, the quarantine is just the horse, the barn, or the premise. Uh, all clinical horses are tested and, no? Only clinical. Only, no. Yeah, then I say all yeah, clinical sorry. horses? Yes. All only, either way. <laughs> um, Non-clinical horses are typically not tested, but do require normal temps. Yes? Clinical meaning EHM or? Uh, clinical meaning disease? nasal discharge, clinical meaning neurologic signs, clinical meaning fevers. Um, yeah, a absolutely across every time if you see a neurologic course, it's definitely getting tested if it's in the same spot. Um, but at most of these, most of the states are also doing uh, clinical signs of uh, discharge, usually. Well, for my racing places, nobody was having abortions because they were racing. Um, Georgia has two different options. They have a 14-day and a 28-day uh, no test. This may be a little bit more stringent than Georgia would typically be because this was at the University of Georgia College of Veterinary Medicine, so they've got a lot of eyes on them. I also talked to the University of Florida, and the University of Florida would do something very similar to this but they would do a 21 day with three consecutive nasal PCR tests. Uh, the academia believes that that is uh, better than doing both blood and nasal as one. Um, however, that, that's what Florida, that's what we did. We'll get into that in just a second. Febrile horses tested. Um, again, 14 days. Georgia was very stringent. I don't know that Georgia would be this stringent if it wasn't the College of Veterinary Medicine, but they also then sent them, and once they released them after day 17 and getting the negative result, they had to go home for an additional 10-day self-quarantine with an OCBI written afterwards that said that those horses were in good health, and at that point they were released. Illinois has a 21 or 28-day, again, febrile horses tested. Uh, if you do 21 days, you have to get, you have to test out, or you can do 28 days with no testing. Uh, New Mexico had a 14-day, ended up being a 14-day quarantine. Febrile horses were tested. Um, exposed horses that had normal temps for 14 days were released without testing at the end of it. Um, index cases required, and any other positive cases did require to have negative PCR results before they were released. Texas has a 21 or a 28 day. Again, 21, you have to test out. Uh, that's what they did for their most recent. Uh, they could, they will also allow a 28 day without testing, or they have in the past allowed 28 days without testing. But most recently, they did 21 days with testing. New York has 28 days, period. They're, uh, they're not going to test the horses to, to get them out. They're going to sit there 
or 28 days. If there's a large facility and they have rights to move, uh, then they can get that on a case-by-case -case basis with, you know, where the state goes out, looks at that facility where they're wanting to go to, uh, writes them, uh, basically, it probably locks them in a sealed trailer with USDA seals and gets them to that new area. Then they're checked in by some other state official and uh, and they're required to stay there. They have very specific rules, no other horses on that property or adjoining or adjacent property. So essentially you're limiting the disease to that specific area and, and no further spread. They do not test, they do not uh, test out, but that's part of the 28 day. So Florida, again, is similar to California in how we do things. Um, we put a quarantine on the entire premise. Once we have confirmation of the neurologic case, we like to do that in the afternoon because then everybody, especially for racing, has already gone. So you don't get this mass exodus of people leaving. That was something that we learned from the Wellington area where we tried to put a quarantine on at about three, but didn't have all the different places locked down. And there was people just scurrying away. So we put this one on um, at night. It also happened that we didn't get our results back till about five, so that helps put it on later too. Um, we go through and make sure that we have strict biosecurity measures. Part of our 14-day release is that they are following biosecurity measures very well. If we do not feel that they are, are practicing, even if we don't get evidence of spread, we'll extend it out. And that's kind of our push to make sure that, that they do what they're supposed to because we found if they practice good biosecurity measures, this disease will stop. Uh, again, monitoring daily, uh, 14 days for us. Again, no clump, no spread. So all we had was the index case. In this case, in, in, in Pace and Park, we were able to isolate that case within an hour of it being reported. Um, all febrile horses test negative on both blood and nasal PCR. Um, all of our high-risk horses, so after our epidemiological investigation, we have a higher and low risk. We didn't do high, medium, and low. We just did high and low. Um, we required those horses to test out. Other, the other way, if we had spread, had we gotten a second case, we would have gone to a 21-day quarantine. Uh, we would have required negative blood and nasal PCRs for release again on those high uh, index or high-risk high horses. In the past, we've also done it where money's a concern and, and time isn't. We've done the 28-day release. Those are usually on like a backyard type of horse where they're just like, hey, we can't afford to do all the testing and, and have the vet out. Uh, so we have done 28 days, but that's generally uh, going to be for uh, economic reasons why we, why we go that route. For Payson Parks specifically, uh, we had seven to eight different department employees working uh, at the incident command structure we, from the beginning. So as soon as that quarantine was leveled, this is the entrance gate to Payson Park. It's set up very nice. It's a huge facility, but it only had two entrances, and one of them had three trees that had grown up through them. So we felt very secure. Nobody's going through and cutting down, you know, a three and a half foot tree. Um, it's a huge facility. I'll give you a little overhead of it. Uh, but it did make things very nice for manning entrances and exits, and we can make sure that nobody was leaving uh, with horses. <clears throat> uh, we traced out our potentially exposed horses. There were five of them that had left uh, between the time that the horse arrived and the time we were able to put the quarantine on. Luckily, um, Courtney and Rusty uh, were on it, and they didn't get anywhere um, in, into their tracks where they, where they were heading. Um, and they have, they have them quarantined appropriately. Again, communication is the key. That's one of the main things from, from the regulatory perspective is how fast can this information get out. Everybody wants it. Um, not only the trainers, they want to know when they can be released, but your other Florida tracks and local tracks want to know what is my risk. And then also all your national parties and your state parties want to know, hey, do I have anything coming my way that I need to be worried about? So this is Payson Park, uh, the, the aerial overview. So that little entrance was right here, and we set up our little incident command post. These are very nice. The minimum distance between some of these were, was 80 feet. Some of them were 120 feet. So it was kind of set up as a night. The original index case was here through our epidemiological uh, investigation. Uh, common trainers, common veterinarians, common jockeys, shared equipment, anything along those lines. 
we've made those four or those three as high risk. Luckily, they had a uh, grass track and a dirt track, so everybody that was low risk worked on the dirt track. Everybody that was high risk worked on the on the grass track, so we kept everybody separate. That might have been overkill, but they were willing to do it, and uh, I was willing to let them do it. Uh, the quarantine, if you can imagine how long that is, the quarantine was about three more of those this way. It's just a huge piece of property, and you'll see the barn, um, but that horse was able to be isolated. The original report came on February 29th. That horse arrived on the 23rd. Uh, it was treated, it had a fever on the 27th, but they thought it was shipping sickness, and so they treated it with antibiotics. It didn't get better. That, that morning, I think 6 or 7 a.m., they called, and it did have neurologic signs. We got, uh, the, like I said, the horse got isolated along with its travel mate uh, to that isolation barn within an hour. Uh, we battle is the Bronson Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory, so we got we got confirmation of the positive that same day, um, and at that point we were heading down to come be a part of the incident management team. We informed South Carolina and Virginia, hey, the shipment came from this van line. Uh, it dropped off. It came from one of those states, and it dropped off horses in the other. Luckily, it only had two spots of drop off, so that was that was good. Um, and those, those states dealt with, uh, with the management of that however they saw fit. Come March 1, we had a, a short incident management team deployed and it was functional by the uh, evening hours. Uh, again, our division employees secured the exits until we were able to get Agwal to come in and help us the following day just to make sure we didn't have anybody leaving at night. They did have a security guard there, but sometimes uh, you can't trust the security guard. They can uh, be like, oh, yeah, my buddies can leave, but everybody else had to stay. We were very fortunate that this racetrack had a great inventory of all horses, so that makes uh, making sure nobody's left substantially easier. And they also kept track of everybody that was doing uh, day trips to local, um, like Calder Racetrack or Tampa Bay Downs, our local um, racing facilities. Just as every time uh, new febrile horses were tested, we ended up having five of them throughout that 14-day period. One of them had a castration site infection. Um, that there were reasons for every one, uh, but we still tested them, and, and they all came back negative. One of our big things was, in, was the distribution of the biosecurity, not only to the owners or trainers, but to their personnel. That was uh, so both English and Spanish versions distribute out this is what they need to do. They were actually already doing a pretty decent job, but uh, just, just helping them uh, get more up to date with that. The following day we had the epidemiological investigation complete. I uh, held separate meetings with trainers and veterinarians to talk to them about different ways that the horses needed to go to get to stay away from the high risk barns, uh, different riding schedules to accommodate uh, the not mixing of the high risk and the low risk horses. Um, the trainers were pretty mad about that, but I think that's just normal. Uh, so we got to have a second meeting with them the next day and tried to work out some of their extra concerns. Uh, again, the five trace outs, uh, three of them <coughs> went to Kentucky and two of them went to New York. I might have that reversed. We also had 33 day trip horses, and that's again from the 20, um, from the 27th whenever, 23rd whenever that horse arrived through uh, whenever we set the quarantine on the 29th. So there were 33 horses that came and left, or left and came back, uh, but we were able to keep a, a, a lookout on those and, and all of them seemed fine. Uh, the, on the third, we were also able to distribute the uh, release protocol, and I will say from a help from where I got the most pressure from was them wanting that release document. What is required? Um, if you had that as a, a regulatory official ahead of time and already knew your plan going in, that would be super helpful um, because I got beat up on that for not having that until the uh, second day, which was quite an improvement from hits whenever we didn't have it until the eighth day. I'm sure Dr. Short was really getting beat up by the eighth day. Uh, we arranged the courier service for March 14th, and all of those horses, 77 of them in total, uh, returned negative, including the two... Uh, the original index horse and uh, his riding or his travel companion. 
The following day, because we didn't get those results until about 10 o'clock at night, those, that horse, uh, those horses were released except for the original two, which t we required an additional test a week later, um, both nasal and blood, and then they were released. All in all, the one-premise quarantine, 670 total horses, one infected horse, one with EHM, didn't die, doing great. Uh, there were some times where we thought it might die, but um, it, anyway, it got better. Uh, only one state put movement restrictions on us. That was West Virginia. Um, that is what it is. And uh, in, all in all, we had 17 horses tested and released. Challenges and, and what we need to do. Um, Assessing the physical facilities, you know, how, how easily are they able to isolate? There's going to be some things where you can't put the isolation horse out. Uh, there's also how well are they prepared to handle this? You know, a bunch of them had actually been, a bunch of these trainers had been through something like this before. They kind of knew the ropes. Uh, it made life a little bit easier. And how secure, I mean, how much are they committed to biosecurity? Because all it takes is a couple people not being committed to it, and they're messing everything up for everybody. So I think you get buy-in. You're like, hey, if you do everything right, 14 days, you mess this up once, it gives them, you know, it gives them the carrot to go after. Everybody's paying a little bit more attention, um, and they're they're about being released. Uh, and and we got buy-in. Most of our horses from Florida go to Kentucky, uh, New York, or to Canada. And we got buy-in from all those with, with this release protocol that we had. Again, communication is our other big key. You're communicating to everybody from other state health officials, industry, your owners and trainers, and then your public media. We had a, 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 a PIO also to help us with all the, the media and the website and such.